Well, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Those of you who are watching online, we're glad to have you joining us for worship this morning. Michael is away with his family, enjoying some time. They're all getting a chance to gather together, and so I'm going to be giving you some announcements for us this morning, just some things that are going on in the life of our church. First of all, as you exit this morning, you will receive one of these if you are a church member. We are voting on the Committee on Committees, and what the Committee on Committees does is they, they help recruit people throughout the year to serve in various places in the church. And so if you don't recognize any of those names and you need to have some help on, on who some of those people are, I'll gladly help you with that. But what you'll do is you'll get one of these and you'll circle two names. You're selecting two out of the names that are on here, and then you'll turn those in. Very soon we'll also be working on our deacon nominations. Secondly, uh, something I want to tell for the ladies of our church, on December the 12th, December the 12th, the ladies' Christmas luncheon, the Tara and Krista are putting that together. Uh, tickets are going to go on sale next week, and those two ladies uh, that want to help host that event, but they're going to need a lot of help. And so if you're interested in helping, if you would see Tara or Krista, uh, and also if you'd like to have a, a ticket, you can see either one of them as well. I uh, found out yesterday that we have an opportunity at Cherokee Ridge um, to help out with, with some turkeys. And so we're going to need 25 turkeys for families at Cherokee Ridge for Thanksgiving. And if you'd be willing to donate one, Michael has to deliver those on Monday, November the 15th. So he will be the contact person for that. But if you're interested in donating a turkey, you can bring it by the church. You can bring it by during office hours or when you have an opportunity. And we can stick it in the freezer and he'll be able to, to give those to the school. I know that's an important thing for us to help take care of. As always, I want to remind you of a couple of the other service projects that we're doing. We have Operation Christmas Child that is going on where you can pack a shoebox. One of the things that we like to do is take our two children and, and uh, let them fill up a box that we send overseas. And what that does is it, it puts the gospel in the hands of people who may not otherwise have access to it. Secondarily, the other thing we're doing is if you notice when you have walked in and out, there are a couple of backpacks back there on our table. What we do is pack those backpacks and send those to Appalachia area, where they also serve as a ministry tool for the sake of the gospel. Uh, you'd be surprised at some of the areas in Appalachia and these coal mine towns that are, that are completely run down. And this, this simple service project serves as a vessel for the gospel to go there. Before we do our monthly memory verse, I'm going to ask uh, Mark Beasy to come up and just give a couple of updates. But he doesn't have a, I need a microphone. morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Beasy, and my wife and I handle a, our jail ministry. I wanted to give you a quick update on that, uh, where we're at, and a new program that we have coming with that. Currently, uh, we are able to, because of partnerships with Walker County Sheriff's Office, where I am the coordinator for jail ministries, among many other <laughs> duties, um, and also with Lookout Mountain Community Services, we are able to assist uh, female inmates who are being released but would normally without assistance be released into homelessness or into abusive situations. So through our um, contact with them, we have Bible studies on Wednesday in both of the cell blocks. There are two women's cell, block, cell blocks and Susan and Alex Litz uh, and another group are in there every Wednesday for an hour providing a Bible study to these ladies. In addition to that, uh, we provide clothing, furnishings, housing, phones, all the things that you may take for granted for these ladies who are coming out with nothing. Some of these ladies go in to prison with, with nothing and were, would be coming out with nothing would it not be for our services. So it's a great opportunity for us to be involved in the lives of these ladies and to help them. Uh, another um, thing that we have going on, we have two ladies right now that we have put into housing and have um, helped them with clothing and furnishings. We have one more in the pipeline who will be getting out soon that will be uh, escaping an abusive situation. And then I'm starting a new program, which is a library uh, for our inmates. And our detention center is nothing more than a way station between arrest and prison. So our guys and, and ladies really don't have that much to do. So I, I like to provide them books. And what I'd like to do is start a program to where if you have old books, um, 
if you could bring those in, what I do is I take those to McKay's and I trade them in for books that these inmates will read. Now, they're probably not going to read the latest Betty Crocker cookbook or do-it-yourself home improvement, but I can take those to McKay's and trade them in for the books that they will read. I'm known as the boss librarian there at the jail, so that's what we do. So that's the program we're looking for. So if you have books that, that you are just having on your shelf, if you would like to be involved in this program, if you could bring those in, or if there's too many, I'll come to your house and get them. And this will establish our library, which we currently don't have, or establish our library at the prison. In, a, in addition, I covered your prayers, any donations. All these go to help these inmates transition from prison into the outside world. And I appreciate your uh, participation in this and your prayers and anything that you would like to get involved with. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. They have lots of different things that are going on. And so, uh, honestly, there's, there's no reason where you, why you can't find somewhere to plug in and serve in some capacity. Uh, I want to do uh, one more small announcement this morning, uh, just as a, as a bit of a request. I want to let all of you familiar faces know, and those of you who are out in TV land today know, one of the things I want to once again encourage us to do is to find a place to plug in and serve. Find a place to plug in and serve and find a small group to be a part of. I emphasize the plug in and serve aspect because one of the things that we, we constantly are trying to do is fill some positions for nursery and working in the children's ministry. Even if you can only serve once a month or something along those lines, that would be extraordinarily helpful. There was one Sunday recently where we actually, one of the hours we, we couldn't offer nursery because we didn't have a nursery worker that day. So if you would, be kind enough to look at your schedule and see about volunteering for nursery. This morning we're gonna begin our time of actual worship with our monthly memory verse. I decided to give you an easy one this month since I gave you a long one last month, and hopefully many of you already know that this one, so let's read this together. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we come to your house this morning longing to connect with you, longing to hear from your word, longing to present ourselves in a, in a humble position of worship. And so, Father, this morning, as we bow our heads and we begin this time together of, of corporately coming before you, Father, I pray that you unite us in worship, that you unite us in action. Father, that your, your spirit would draw us close to you this morning in this place as we humbly worship you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Please join us as we worship.
Churches to operate in that in that way. We're going to be in two different passages this morning. We're going to be in First Peter chapter five, First Peter chapter five, but we're also going to be looking back about what Peter is is speaking to in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter thirty four. I know that's not a book that people usually jump to, so I'm giving it to you ahead of time so that you can start flipping through the pages, or just go to the front of your Bible and look and see what page number it's on, <clears throat> and maybe you can you know go back to the old school days, and memorize your books of the Bible, and you'll, you'll be able to find it. But anyways, Ezekiel's about in the middle of your Bible, and anyways, you can you can find those two places. So 1 Peter chapter 5 and Ezekiel chapter 34, we're going to be looking at those two passages. Now, not that long ago, I preached through the book of Peter, and so some of this will have some familiarity to it, because we've looked at these verses before in their context in the passage, and we, try, we sought to unpack them. Now, <coughs> since we've started this discussion on elders, I've had a, a few questions from folks that said that have asked me, you know, is our church looking to, to move in that direction? Well, in our functionality, yes, we are. We we already operate sort of in that way, anyways. We have pastors. We have Michael and myself who are who are would be shepherds, who'd be elders, who'd be considered to be in that capacity already. <coughs> the New Testament, though, speaks to a plurality of elders having more than just a couple. And there's many, many reasons for that, and I'll, I'll speak more to that as the, the sermon goes on. But structuring that way is, is a healthy thing. One of the things, um, well, I'll, I'll get, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, I want people to know where we're going with this and why we're having this conversation is because from the New Testament, it is the healthiest model for the structure of a church. So if you join me first in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to read these five verses together. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording over those allotted to your charge. 
but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So Peter is giving this instruction. This is instruction he's giving is on the tail end of him having a conversation about dealing with suffering. Much of First Peter is a conversation about dealing with suffering that's going on. And so this is not a theological tangent that he's going on. No, he's talking about the necessity of having leaders and those who are in the position of shepherding during these difficult moments. Verse 1 is a therefore. I say it every single time. Every time there's a therefore, we ask what it's there for. It tells us to look back to the conversation that was previously going on. Previously, it's been talking about suffering and the suffering of the people of God. <clears throat> and so what it's saying is that we need courageous leadership in the face of difficulty or suffering. We need leaders who will rise to the top and not cower and, and, and not move to the shadows during difficult times. Do any of you watch the news? Okay. Do any of you pay attention to what is going on in our country? Is it not a daggum mess? All right. So in the midst of mess, we need those who will rise to the top, who are willing to lead. And if you look across the gambit of evangelical churches, not just ours, we don't have many who want to be shepherds, who want to be elders, who want to even be deacons. To rise to the position of serving in a position of leadership is often complicated. And so Peter is saying, let us not forget that we need to have those who are willing to rise up and do the work. And they are... Imagine what's going on here in the, in the context of what Peter's talking about. These are scattered folks who are trying to follow after Christ. They're certainly facing great persecution. So one could only imagine that being a, a shepherd, being an elder, would put a, a bullseye directly on your back from persecutors, from those who would persecute you. And so shepherds are needed during hard times, during persecution, when the, the suffering is there. Secondly, we need shepherds to help lead, to help lead the church, to help lead the flock during those difficult times. Shepherds are, are needed all the more during those times for the sake of righteousness. Peter's describing Christians, he's speaking to this idea of Christians who are, who are molding themselves into the world rather than being willing to suffer persecution. I've made this uh, comment before, um, and I've made it, I guess, during my entire service of ministry, whether it's here or other places, that there are coming days where it's not going to be as comfortable to be an evangelical Christ follower as it has been in the past, okay? It's not going to be as easy in the future to say, I believe what the Word of God says about what it says rather than what the world says. And so Peter is dealing with people in that same exact kind of context. He's dealing with the idea that there are folks who are willing to mold themselves into the shape of the world rather than to mold themselves into the shape of what God says things are supposed to be. You with me this morning? Understand what I'm talking about? So this is why he's saying we need elders, we need shepherds, to call that out, to speak that out, to say what is true and what is not true, to bring those who are struggling back, to correct those misunderstandings and those misdirections. And so Peter's exhortation is powerful. He begins with an appeal to the elders who are in the various churches in Asia Minor. One thing that should catch our eye is that <coughs> Peter approaches this in a very distinct way, though. His exhortation, his encouragement to them, he doesn't come at them with his apostolic you know, title, which Jesus had given to him, which he rightly has. He doesn't come to that with him to that. He says, I I'm Peter writing to you as a fellow elder, as an elder with you, as one who knows the challenges, the difficulties, the, the functioning and the, the shepherding over a local church. And so he says, I'm writing to you as a shepherd myself. Remember back in John 21, Jesus, it was encouraging Peter to, to feed my sheep, to feed my sheep when he restored Peter from his, from his foul rejection of Christ. Peter says, he was also, he says, look, I, I was a witness, your elder and a fellow witness of the sufferings of Christ. He witnessed it. He was there when it happened. He said, I, I saw it. So <clears throat> Peter's not unaware of the suffering that these shepherds that he's writing to, these elders that he's writing to are having to deal with. So Peter saw the suffering of his master, his teacher, his Lord. And Peter's not unaware that you oftentimes have to suffer. Uh, I cannot distinguish this and, and, or, or speak this enough. There are those that are out there that will tell you if you simply come to Christ, it's all going to be unicorn and rainbows and you won't have to worry about suffering ever again. That is utter foolishness. I don't know how you can come to the word of God and see that is true. 
Jesus even specifically said, if they were against me, surely they're going to be against you if you're following me. And so look, if, 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 there's not any, if there's not any turbulence in your life, if there's not any rough roads, then maybe you should say, am I truly following after Christ in a way that shows obedience, or am I being molded to the world? Then Peter goes on. Peter is a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. Through suffering, their hope is the glory that will come later. Peter is sharing about the hope of looking forward to the glorious return of Christ. And on the basis of these things is how he makes his appeal to these elders. But he starts off by saying, look, I'm a fellow elder. I saw Jesus. I, I saw his suffering. And I'm a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. That which is to come. This life is bam. It's, it's, it's but a glimpse. It is but a vapor in the book of James, it tells us. It comes and it goes so quickly. I, I tell you, I'm going to use a specific example that is, that is a, a prayer request for, for our church this morning. Okay, So I'm not sure if you know Rodney and Julie Brewer. They're, they're two of our church members. So Julie went into the hospital like just suddenly, and, and doctors weren't sure how things were going to go for her. And it happened like pretty much overnight in a glimpse. She went from seeming fine to being very, very unhealthy. She's still in ICU now. She is improving, and there's lots of folks that have been praying for her. Rodney dropped by this morning to let us know that some things are going in a good direction. But goodness, folks, life is, man, it is but a glimpse. And Peter is saying, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. I know that it, even though we're facing suffering here, that that which is coming is going to be so much better. You with me this morning? You hear that? Do you understand that? I, I look at my life and I say to myself, I'm 40 years old in your life. And some of you are like, yeah, I wish I was 40 again. But look, to me, I'm like, when I was 20 and I looked at 40, I was like, dang, those people are old. Now I'm 40, and I'm like, I'm young. Shut up. The truth of the matter is, though, life goes by so quickly. I'm going to have a teenager in December, and I'm like, man, I, I, I'm not old enough to have that. But the, the, the truth is, life just goes by so quick. And, but this, this glory that is to be revealed is so much better. So he's, he's going with this basis of, of all of this. And then in verse 2, he says, shepherd the flock. Shepherd the flock of God that are among you. Elders... Uh, function as shepherds is a vivid image that, that men are supposed to shepherd the flock of God. Scripture is full of this imagery of shepherding. Now, I'll tell you, there, there are two reasons for that. One, it was pretty commonplace for there to be lots of shepherds and sheep. It was a pretty normal job. A lot of people had livestock and animals, and that's something they did. I mean, think about Christmas time. We think about, you know, the, the angels coming to the shepherds while they were by their flocks by night. They were shepherding them. Well, our first example that I want us to, to see is, is from the negative perspective. perspective. Over in Ezekiel chapter 34, if you'll join me over there in our, in our passage this morning, we're going to look at the first eight verses just quickly. <coughs> Beginning in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. And diseased, you have not healed. And broken, you have not bound up. The scattered, you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity, you have dominated them. <clears throat> they were scattered for lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains on every high hill. My flock was scattered all over the surface of the earth, and there was no one to search that for them or seek for them. <clears throat> Therefore, you shepherds, hear the, Lord, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my flock has become a prey, my flock has become food for all the beasts of the field for lack of a shepherd. And my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, I'm going to keep going. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the word of the Lord. Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep from them, and will make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, and I will deliver my flock from their mouth, so that they will not be food for them. Now, this <coughs> imagery that he's painting right here, he's not, he's not actually talking about the sheep animals, all right? He's not talking about the actual livestock. He's talking about the people. He's talking about the nation of Israel. And he's relating that to this. And so what we're going to see in this is a condemnation. What he's speaking to Ezekiel is, is to give them a condemnation, to condemn them for some particular actions. The first thing he says is they were feeding the sheep. I mean, they were feeding themselves and not feeding the sheep. They weren't feeding them. The, the sheep have to be fed. 
One of the primary functions of a, of a shepherd, of an elder, of a pastor, is to speak the truth, is to feed the sheep through the teaching of God's word. <coughs> and this is what they're to do. Shepherds need to make sure that the evangelist, that the pastor, the one that is filling the pulpit, is feeding the flock. And shepherds themselves must be teaching and instructing the flock to, to the, the word of God. Now, this doesn't mean only sermons. It, that, that's not what, at all what it means. It's not only what happens on Sunday morning in the pulpit. It is also in, in Bible studies. It is also in Sunday school classes. It is also, and that doesn't mean that every person who teaches a Sunday school class necessarily has to be an elder. But what it means is that can be part of the capacity that takes place. It means they're involved in the lives of people, feeding them with the words so they can feed the flock. So the, the, the church should have an expectation for their elders, for their leaders in that capacity to teach and to train and to instruct. The second condemnation that he gives here in Ezekiel is that the weak sheep were not strengthened. The sick sheep were not healed. The injured sheep were not bound up. The straying sheep were not brought back. The lost sheep were not sought after. Another primary work for the, the shepherd is to care for the weak and for the, those who are broken. Shepherds are to seek them. Shepherds are to love them. And as the church, we don't be surprised when a shepherd comes to us when we are struggling or straying. <coughs> That's part of their task. And so don't be offended if they come to you because that is simply, simply the job of the shepherds who come to the sheep. Third, the shepherds in, here in Ezekiel, they, they failed to, to, to guide them and guard them and rule over them properly. Instead, they ruled with force and harshness. God condemns the shepherds who see their position as a position of power. Shepherds who have a mentality of it is my way or the highway, and it is more of a it's more of a bullying process rather than it is a leading process. Rather than rather than doing what the apostle Paul says of you know following me even after even as I follow Christ, no, it's more of you're going to do it my way, and if you don't like it, too bad. And so they rule with force and harshness, and by contrast, that's not what a good shepherd looks like. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd in John chapter 10. And the example of Jesus is what good shepherding, shepherding looks like. Back over in 1 Peter in chapter 5 and verse 4, Jesus is called the chief shepherd. In verse 4, the, the, the chief shepherd, Jesus is the model of how he led his disciples and how he led the multitudes and how he led even other religious leaders. The images here are so bound up in that verb, shepherd, in this particular case, he's not just saying uh, shepherd. When he used that first word, shepherd the flock, he's using it as a verb rather than a noun in that particular sentence. When he says shepherd, it's an action, it's an active, active word. So he says to shepherd them, to model yourself after Christ. And so when we look to those who would be shepherds, when we look to those who would be elders, we look and see if they carry the characteristics that are of Christ. Now, obviously, they're not going to be perfect. Shepherds, elders, they're still sinful, broken people who need the grace of God. With me? Hear me on that? All right? But they are shepherding. Something that can be easily over, overseen is he says here, he says, shepherd the flock among you. That's one thing I want us to, to catch and to hear clearly. Shepherd the flock among you. This is important, and it could be easily overlooked. Shepherding take, takes place where we are. And, and where the, the church is, where the sheep are. We're not shepherding in other, other churches or in other cities. Look, I was brought here to be a, a pastor, an elder, a shepherd here in this place. And this is the place where I am responsible for. I'm not responsible for those who are down the street at another church. Now, we have some connection to some of those folks, but we're, I'm not shepherding them because those are the ones who are not given to me in this place. And so <clears throat> you're to watch over those who are with you here. You may... <clears throat> not know that but uh, that's why we emphasize membership oftentimes it's because look it, it, church membership is a healthy thing it says that you're a, a part of this body now look if you regularly attend we still are going to try and keep up with you and still try and shepherd and walk with you in your life but that's why we emphasize being a, a, a member here is that man just pragmatically it puts you on some lists and things and has your right name and phone number and contact information and stuff we just regularly can contact you that way that's why it's an essential aspect of, of being a part it's just complicated when we have Several hundred people that go to church here in three different services, it's, a, it's nearly impossible to keep up with all of that if you don't have some sort of connection point here at the church. And so that's, I'm going to pound that drum over and over again about being a church member and being a, a part of a small group and being uh, you know, under the, the shepherding of a local church the way the New Testament has, has designed it to be. 
And so we got to understand that they, there is a responsibility for these shepherds who are giving oversight for your, for your very spiritual life. And so I'm going to encourage you to, to get involved and get more connected. And your shepherds want to watch out for you. <clears throat> now look, we do have connections with other churches. We do have associations that we're part of. We do have uh, conventions that we're part of, the Southern Baptist Convention. However, in all of that, we function as our own autonomous entity as a church, the way that Christ has established us. And so shepherds help make decisions for the church, and these shepherds make decisions for the flock. So how should these elders lead us? Well, Peter tells us, he says, Shepherd the flock among you, exercising overthought, oversight, so you have oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. There's going to be three statements here that he gives that are going to be not this way, but this way. They're going to be not but statements. Not this way, but do it this way. So not like this. So it's not a not under compulsion, but voluntarily. So I don't think Peter is saying, saying that we should not compel men to be shepherds, but what he's saying is they should have a desire to do the work. They should have a, a desire to do the job willingly. You should not have to compel them to want to strengthen their brothers and sisters in Christ. Sheep must, desi- you know, must be the shepherd's de- desire. They desire. And the shepherd must be willing to work among us. I believe Peter is exhorting shepherds to love their work and be willing to do it, to have a, a love for their work and be willing to do it. I've told people this a hundred different times. In every job, in every capacity, I don't care what you're doing, you do a lot of stuff that you don't like to do to get to the little bit of stuff that you do like to do. Ministry, I don't think, can be exactly that same way. Surely, yes, there are things that are annoying that I don't want to do. Absolutely. And there are certainly things that I like better than other things. But there should, there has to be a desire among the, the, uh, the elders, the shepherds, to do the work. They have a desire for it. And have you ever met somebody that gets put into a position of authority and they like that authority just a little bit too much? Okay, When you're looking for elders, you're not looking for people who are like that. You're not looking for people who just want to lord it over them. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus pulls the disciples aside and has a conversation with them. And he, this conversation that he has with them is, is saying, look, I don't want you to be those who are like the, the Gentiles who use authority to just lord it over others. As a matter of fact, if you want to be first, you're going to have to be last. Servant leadership is the structure that shows up in Scripture. I think sometimes people get in their mindset of, of elders having you know, this, this scary idea of just being authoritarian dominance of, of yes men at the church that just do whatever they want to do. That's not at all the biblical picture. Now, has that happened in some churches? Sure. And the way that that happens is when, they, when elders are selected in an unbiblical way, when we don't look to biblical qualifications to choose appropriately those who would be shepherds and elders. We, need to, we must take it very, very seriously. We must measure it very, very deeply. And so he says very specifically, they've got to be willing to love the sheep. They've got to be willing to bind the sheep up. They've got to be willing to, to function in that capacity. So it starts out with a, with a willingness. Shepherd the flock among you, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. Not because you, you have to, but because you want to. There's a distinction there. All right. Uh, <clears throat> then he says... Um, um, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Okay, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Not this way, but this way. Sordid gain. All right, we don't use that word sordid very much. All right, he, he's saying not for shameful gain. Okay, but for but eagerly, with with eagerness, not with shamefulness, but with eagerness. They they're willing to work, and it's not saying that they don't deserve pay. But, uh, uh, but a recognition that they don't do it for pay. There are other places in Scripture where, where there's conversations about what is uh, appropriate, that uh, they are worthy of their, their pay, but they have a heart to shepherd the kingdom of God for the, the, the purpose of, of spiritual growth, not for financial growth. Um, so many times when I, I look and I see these, these popular televangelists having multi multi million dollar homes and thing it, it just something seems way way wrong about that now look i i'm of the of the of the sort that um i don't think you need i also don't think you need to have poverty pastors okay i don't i don't think that that is all, at, by, at all the definition of what scripture says i think they're definitely worthy of a fair pay of a fair income that's that's perfectly fine but, but getting rich off of the, the church and getting rich off of doing ministry, I, 
I guess this doesn't make any it doesn't make any logical sense to you. Do you see anywhere in scripture where that takes place? Look, you know, there are rich people in scripture. King Solomon, King David, a lot of these folks who, you know, King David, who's the, the man after God's own heart, they had some money, folks. Some of these people, you know, had had some serious money. All right. And, and so it's not saying that pastors aren't worth their pay. But what it's saying is they don't do it for the pay. As a matter of fact, as we're talking about elders, we're looking at the, the distinction in churches where there are, you know, paid elders and there are actually unpaid elders. They're, they're serving in that capacity because they have a, a heart calling to do that. It means that they volunteer that, that is their sacrificial work. And so it is saying that shepherds are not to lead for pay even while they deserve to be paid. Make sense with me on that this morning? Good. They lead because they love God and they love the church. This is the third not but statement. Not domineering, not domineering, but being examples to the flock. Not domineering over those you lead, but being examples to the flock. <clears throat> the shepherds have charge over the church. They're, they're, they're given that authority in Scripture. Elders are. Pastors are. But Peter says that they're supposed to care with what they're in charge of. What they're charge of, in charge of is a, is a great responsibility. The shepherds are not to be domineering and lording their rule over the flock. That's exactly what appeared to be happening over in Ezekiel chapter 34, and they were condemned for doing so. I think one of the primary ways that a shepherd can domineer over the flock is by telling others, th others things to do that they're not willing to do themselves. So uh, I told you the church I was at last, I was, I was there for just over seven years. And uh, the pastor who was there, when he retired, he had been there for 31 years. His name Michael. He had a great deal of influence in my, in my life and in my, uh, my ministry. And um, just, just watching him and him mentoring me. And uh, he's, he's a little bit nuts, but that's okay. Every pastor I think is. You know, I'd, I'd, he'd, uh, he'd, he'd want us to do some particular task, and he'd be, all right, he needs 7.30. All right, Pastor, I'll be there. Get there at 7.30. He'd already been there for 20 minutes doing whatever it was we were going to be doing. You know, you, you show up on the church property, and he's out there just in, in ripped jeans and, and, uh, and a backpack sprayer, and he's out there spraying weeds and just doing all kinds of stuff. He didn't have to do that. We actually paid a company to do that, but he just wanted to, to do the work, and he was never afraid to get his hands dirty, whether it was cleaning toilets or preaching a sermon or whatever it was. The way that you don't domineer is, you, is, is that same idea that comes from the, those Gospels that I was just mentioning this morning about that, we are, that there's a willingness to serve. Because Jesus himself even didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's basically what we're mimicking in, in an elder-type rule. So they were examples, and they were not domineering. Shepherds are doing what is right and telling us to do the work that is with them. Their lives reflect that, and, and it takes it in a direction. They don't have the, the attitude of, I'm the boss, you have to do what I say. No, Jesus, the chief shepherd, never exhibited that quality uh, among his disciples. No, he never carried himself that way. He merely said, this is what I'm doing, come join me. Come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. This is what he called to some of them. It's not saying this is what you should do, and not, but, but not me. No, it's saying this is what we are doing. Let's do it together. Then he speaks to this unfading crown. This unfading crown, he says, And when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, when he appears, you'll receive an unfading crown of glory. An unfading crown of glory. That there's coming a time that, that, that things will come to an end, and there is a reward of the unfading crown of glory that you receive from the chief shepherd, Jesus himself. The wreaths and crowns that were received from sporting competitions back in the back during this time period, those things would fade away. They would wilt and rot and, and they would fall apart. But the unfading crown of glory is this unfading victory that is given to us. Do these things in the face of persecution and suffering, and you'll receive an unfading crown of glory. When we look at this life, our, our a lot of times our tendency is to is to say this. That's not fair. Right? We're, especially when we're trying to live in obedience, we're trying to follow after Christ, and some, some negative thing comes to our life, and we think to ourselves, that's not fair. Why do I have to do that? Or why can't I do this? Or why can't I have... And we're reminded in this that, man, we have this unfading crown of glory if we are faithful to follow after Christ. So look, shepherding is often a, a difficult job. It can even sometimes be a thankless job. But they do a great work and we give them honor and respect for, for what they do. So our response to this, 
Peter tells us what we are to do. He says, Your young, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. Now, again, in this conversation, it may seem like he is merely speaking about those who are younger and older. But in the original language, it is not necessarily, the best interpretation is not to think about it that way. It's actually saying that those of you who are under the authority of elders, that you look to them, you subject yourself to your elders. And all of you, this is elders included, everybody, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humility, meekness, it's often seen as, as weakness in the, in the world and culture that we look at, but it's, it's really not. Uh, a humble, meek approach to this is exactly what Christ would have. And so what he's asking us to do is to yield to the elders, to the shepherds, to join with them as they take the church forward and lead. We join in the work. We roll up our sleeves. They're working in the church to, to do things. And so we get connected. We get involved. We get active. And we join to serve um, our chief shepherd. Now, you've heard all of this. You've heard about this task that it is, even the past two weeks, when we combine those two ideas together of, of man, this sounds like a monumental task for, for a shepherd, for an elder to do. Specifically, it would be a massive task for one person to try and do, right? Would you agree with me? This would be too much for one person. In a church of our size, it's too much for, for two people. So the truth is, Scripture speaks to a, a plurality of elders because it's a massive task. New Testament talks about leaders being this way so that they can <clears throat> care for the body of Christ. And I told you that, yeah, the, the, the fear among some is that the, the pastor could just surround himself with, with yes men and getting those to just simply follow after his own opinion. But no, actually, having elders is the greatest safeguard for accountability among elder and pastoral leadership that you could ever create. And it's necessary. Because what it gives permission, it gives permission to hold one another to a higher standard. It gives permission also to focus on the things that God has gifted you with and allow you to do those things while other men or who are gifted in other areas do other things. It's kind of like this weird thing like the body of Christ. I don't know, Scripture may have talked about it somewhere. But in doing so, it, it, it strengthens the church. It, it, it enables the church to better function and care for the people and take the gospel to the world that so desperately needs to see it, where we are building his kingdom and not our kingdom. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, for how it faithfully teaches us, for how it communicates the necessities uh, of obedience for your church. Father, as we discuss the, the structure of your church and we look at what it means to be led in your church, help us to, to, be, to be those who want to be faithfully obedient to what your word says. God, help the spirit to bring about any correction in our hearts that needs to needs to be reevaluated where we look at sin or, or you know or rebellion that we have and we, we we turn from that and we turn to you father god this morning as we've had a conversation concerning this the the, the aspect of leadership and being a part of a church my prayer is that each person in here this morning has a desire to be a part of a church has a desire to be under the the shepherding of a church and father will will seek to to join our church and become a part of this flock this year Father, we thank you this morning. We want to humbly submit to you in this final song of worship. Just praise and honor that you are due. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
too.